All right, Tim, we are back. And a couple weeks ago, we were talking fat loss. I thought it might be a good idea to get into what does a good training program for fat loss look like? Well, go back to what we talked about in that fat loss podcast. It's going to be this psychological aspect, right? The the dynamic of there's a lot more hurdles to jump over and restrictions to people getting momentum. So I, I think the best place to start on this is that is getting small wins and building upon what they're currently doing and just trying to encourage and nudge in that direction of doing more because it's good again going to come down to the physiological aspect of eating less expending more or some combination of both and then you get into the the inver- the conversation and the interview about okay well what have you been doing what have you been successful with what can we start to make inroads on and a lot of times it just gets to like, if I keep asking enough probing questions, they're going to kind of give you the, the blueprint for them. And I think that's the part as most coaches start to unpack it's I, I would, if you just take away the psychological aspect, it's pretty easy, right? Exercise more, eat less right. and get, get that dynamic figured out. It's when the psychological aspect gets inserted back in, it becomes more and more challenging. And I think that's where you got to figure out to meet them where they're at and start to unpack what it is that's been blocking them. And a lot of times they've had success in some way, shape or form. So it's probably behooves you as a coach to kind of piggyback off of that where you'll be really tested is the, the evolution from there. Cause the, the plateau is inevitable. And especially if you do like an addition by subtraction, as we talked about before, of adding in more protein, adding in more fiber, they're going to eat less organically or less calories or energy dense foods because they're eating foods that are more filled with fiber and protein are going to be a little bit longer and more more energy to actually break down and assimilate and that process kind of organically makes them eat less uh but then they'll hit a plateau right and they'll start to get into some whatever wall they start to get through and i think that's where you start to get back into the physiology aspect of all right, well, now we have to titrate down the amount of calories. Now we have to titrate up the amount of expenditure, and we keep working through that. But I want to start with that. <coughs> and then we can get into now the, the next level of the actual programming. And as we start to look at this from a two-pronged approach, I always look at it, there's going to be feedback loops for people. And I'm all about momentum when it comes down to weight loss. And a common strategy I try to utilize. And this is like the circumstance that we might be placed in within if we're working in a private setting and we have to charge by the session that, yeah, I ideally I'll be able to get you in for a certain amount of time throughout a given week that initiates enough change. But the truth is that's cost prohibitive at a certain point, right? I can't just have you come six days a week for six, one hour sessions. Like eventually like, You'll burn through all your sessions and it becomes extremely expensive. But on the other note, it gets through this kind of, all right, well, if I'm going to have a really challenging workout, I'm going to have to have some recovery built in. And the, the initial thought when we're doing high performance is at least at most what we call low CNS day, where it's minimal expenditure and not really taxing into high threshold motor units. But on the other note, that's actually not in the best interest for someone trying to lose weight because it, the feedback loops from hydration and eating good foods and being conscious of energy expenditure gets thrown out the window. We're, we're not trying to make them faster or more explosive. And this is the other part too, the, the master of none kind of concept of we're just trying to do everything and throw a grenade. Like it, it's, actually sometimes important that we carpetmentalize goals and we say, well, what do you want? Let's get very, very specific because one of the things that becomes very problematic is the overlapping. Like, well, I want to get stronger and I want to be able to run a 10 K and I want to be able to lose 30 pounds. And then also too, I want to be able to do this competition. That's extremely anaerobic and explosive and like, all right, well, what's the most important and what's the timeline here? Like in due time, I guess, like if you want to do a tough mutter and lose 30 pounds, 
and you're completely sedentary and you're 30% body fat and, and this morbidly obese caricature of like whatever it is from the BMI scale we talked about in the last one. Okay, we have to start to prioritize certain things at certain times. And not saying it's impossible to do some of those other things, but the reality of the situation is right now, weight loss or body comp takes precedent and that's gonna look different, right? And that's gonna look a lot different than what we do for prepare for a competition like a Tough Mudder or a 10K or an athlete getting ready for a combine. Like there's just, there's very different arcs. And when I'm thinking about organizing my training plan, like yes, the training plan itself is gonna be very dense and we'll go through that here in a little bit, but the actual hour that we're working out is gonna be extremely dense and it's gonna be have a high work to rest ratio. And it's gonna require a lot of energy expenditure during that hour that hopefully creates this non-exercise ex energy expenditure or what we call NEAT after the workout that it's per continuously burning calories throughout the rest of your day that your body's internal temperature is raised and you're now burning energy just to survive and recover. But then the next day it's, yeah, we, we probably can't afford to go every single day of the week, but the other end of it, it's, I have to now get you doing something that is extremely low coaching intensive that is cyclical or repetitive and we keep doing it over a period of time so that you can do it whenever and wherever and where you live makes a big difference on it and the if i'm living in a very nice climate and i can walk every day great i can go for a run every day great i can do swimming great uh but most of the world doesn't and uh, we have to figure out strategies a certain part of the year of how we're going to get this person to do exercise when they're not at the facility and to be honest they'll be coming to like well i could just do yoga like well if you want to lose weight it's kind of a waste of time right that's not it's not a bad modality it's just what's the actual expenditure during that hour uh, or that 30 minutes it's just productive procrastination probably a better one would be can you get a, a membership at planet fitness and do elliptical for 30 right. to 60 minutes and i and i'm not trying to sit there and say that yoga is inferior but it's just less specific to the goal. And then I guess the part we often miss when we're trying to get it is like, and the plethora of information out there, like the best exercises lose weight and you get these generic script, like scripts of what to do, of like back squat and overhead press. And I call them mouth breathing experts. Like they're just, <gasps> you should back squat and you look like me and they, they don't, you don't want to look like them or they're just on pharmaceutical enhanced program uh, protocols. And they, they look like they're what they do, not from effort or hard work and dedication, but the, the willingness to do, do things that are probably going to have long-term health complications and almost detaching from that and attaching from anecdotal or this causation correlation phenomenon and getting back to of like, you're going to just have to burn more calories and eventually eat less calories. And that's the construct. And I, I, we can get into a little bit more specific, but does that kind of get a good start for this going? If you're like listening to that, like I know there's a lot of areas and things I touched on, but I want to get stopped there for a second and go. That's a really that good, it's a really good jumping off point. I think one thing I want to kind of dive back into is that the dichotomy of like, oh, I want to gain muscle, but also I want to lose weight and I want to get stronger, more powerful. Like they, they don't always work hand in hand. Can you go into a little more why you can't necessarily gain, make a lot of, strength or power gains if your focus really is truly fat loss yeah um, and I, that that's actually a really uh interesting question because it just makes me harken back to going into gnc's and vitamin worlds and and then getting supplements that would claim to do both and reading muscle and fitness magazine that would claim to do both right and from a physiological perspective i think it's a it's pretty obvious that the body is going to lean hard into one state from a catabolic or breaking down or anabolic or building up. And whatever kind of parameters you organize your day from an energy intake and energy expenditure is going to lean more into building or breaking down. Uh, and I, I think that part is pretty critical. Now, the rate of which and the, and the quantity of which a lot is based off of how long you've been in that state of certain body composition or muscle mass. So people with more muscle mass will stay at a higher muscle mass and less body fat versus people in a lower body, higher body fat and lower muscle mass will stay in that state. And the rate in which change 
is going to be contingent upon that setup and how long you're in that state. But the the other side of it is even if someone is extremely muscular and very lean or vice versa, extremely have a high amount of adipose tissue and not a lot of muscle tissue, relatively speaking, that if we are in a deficit, both in a caloric intake perspective and then from a increased energy perspective, we're going to eventually get to some sort of catabolism and breaking down tissue all no matter what, right? It's just, you don't have a net positive caloric intake or you're exercising too much to either maintain that muscle tissue or maintain that adipose tissue. And that part is hopefully the thing that makes sense here. It's this dynamic that yes, you're going to be whatever you're going to be based off of how long you've been in that a little bit more so than you would be otherwise. But the other end of it is if you are genuinely in a caloric deficit from eating less and exercising more, you're going to break down tissue. Just the simple fact of the matter. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, someone who is extremely sensitive to certain protocols and certain things and have a higher degree of fluctuation, you might see a, a greater rate and a greater amount of change. But the truth is, is, if you just keep that same thought process in your mind of if you're eating less and you're exercising more and over time, you will be less in terms of body mass. And that will come either in the form of less muscle tissue or less actual fat tissue. And the other alternative is true. If you're trying to gain, you have to be in a surplus in some way, shape or form. And I, that part hopefully just feels intuitive, right? It's the, it's the bank account analogy of, you keep pulling money out. The money just doesn't miraculously go in no matter how much interest you're accruing, right? If you're spending more than you put in, then your bank account starts to deplete. And you can say, well, I have a high interest CD or a bank account or some sort of financial agreement that I gain money back. Yeah, but you're taking out more money than the interest is accruing. So therefore you are losing money in your bank account. That's the same thing with physiology. I mean, I, it's tried to be like a little bit more elementary and hopefully that makes a little bit more sense, but we can, we can convolute that conversation a lot more than it actually really is. And it's just pretty simple. You exercise more and you eat less based off of what your body's set point is. You're going to eventually lose. You just got to do it long enough. Right. It, it harkens back to like the idea of fat loss is we are breaking down. So it's important mm -hmm. to understand that is the goal and that come, that's going to come secondary of performance, which is why, you know, if you work with athletes, you're usually telling them, Hey, let's keep the weight loss towards the off season where you don't have to perform at a high level. Right. Yeah. And you, you sort of tease it out into what a training session is going to look like. So we establish we're trying to break stuff down. You might not always be performing at a high level. So how does that influence the training program design standpoint? Yeah. So there's a couple pathways we need to kind of understand. And they're big, fancy, long syllable words like gluconeogenesis and then lipolysis. Mm -hmm. And essentially, gluconeogenesis is taking one energy substrate and then converting it into, or one thing and converting it into energy, specifically ATP or glucose. And that process is a survival aspect our body will need glucose right our brain needs glucose first and foremost and then our muscles need glucose and in a fasted state where i don't have a lot of energy intake in which is from a evolutionary standpoint the majority of our life exists in, in terms of not having energy in complete amounts that we have right it is omnipresent now but it wasn't always the case so the majority of our our DNA is tied into how do we survive without a abundance of energy to eat? And that dynamic is why we have this pathway of gluconeogenesis. So if I can take muscle tissue, I can take fat tissue and then convert that into, into energy and the, the yielding energy from a, from a molecule of fat versus a molecule of muscle is it's a lot harder to break down muscle, which is hopefully good because we can preserve it longer. And it's a lot not easy to break down fat tissue, but hopefully in theory, that's a lot more available to based off of the way we set it up. And this is why you'll hear theories like fasted cardiovascular work might be more effective than having energy, especially for fat loss, because we don't have available glucose and the body will find the next available substrate, which is depending on what state we're in of ketosis or having some amount of glucose circulating might be more prone to utilizing fat as fuel. But then the other end of it in terms of the type of exercise that if I'm doing long state or long, slow, steady state stuff, sometimes 
a lot of times referred to as zone two. LSD is the common term. I know that probably has a connotation of of psychedelic drugs. And, yeah, but that's the term LSD, long, slow distance, that I can do something over a longer period of time at a steady state. That's just a simple way to look at it. And heart rate is nice. You can extrapolate zone two as maybe a, a two to three on the RPE scale where I can hold a conversation. That's pretty much your simple proxy of if I was running next to you, Corey, and you were trying to have a conversation about this right here, could we run this podcast while doing steady state cardiovascular work? Yes or no. And if I can't, it's probably too intense. And then if it gets past a certain threshold, which is this anaerobic threshold, or when we start utilizing this glycolytic or sometimes referred to as lactic energy system, that I'm no longer maybe breaking down fat tissue, I might going into this actual window of utilizing muscle tissue or amino acids that are available because they need energy faster. And that process, keeping it really simple is the foundation for, okay, what a training session would look like. It's intensity. All training programs really break down into choosing exercises that we can be successful with and then doing a certain amount at a certain intensity with a certain amount of rest specific to the goal. That's the simplest way I can break down any program, right? What exercises can you do? You present to me, I have pain, I have some sort of restriction, I have some sort of compensation. Okay, now that exercise shrinks down, right? So now I wanna pick those exercises that I can do redundantly or repeatedly, and I combine that with the goal. And you wanna lose body fat, you wanna lose weight. So it's gotta be high duration, a low intensity, with maybe, depending on the intensity, minimal rest. If it was a little bit higher intensity, I just need a, lot lo a little bit longer rest, but I still want to have a very, what we call dense session. And that goes into this, hey, I'm gonna burn through my glycogen in the, in the muscle cell, which is the storage form of glucose and carbohydrates at the muscle. That glycogen gets depleted because I'm now burning through whatever glucose and, and ATP that I have. And I'm not allowing my body to restore creatine phosphate levels and ATP levels to the short term form of energy at that muscle cell and allowing for that next phase of I don't need glycogen because I have enough recovery in between bouts of stuff that I don't need to tap into glycogen. But when I start to shorten the rest or elongate the work, I start to eat glycogen more and then I have to find more energy substrates. And that comes from hopefully fat. And depending on my, st my, my state of energy intake, whether I'm in a fasted state or a caloric deprived state or potentially a carbohydrate deprived state. And that's the part too, I think a lot of people often miss from a physiology perspective. Restricted carbohydrate diets aren't restricted carbohydrate diets, they're fat centric diets. And that in a form is fasting. All fasting is, is restricting glucose. So I can, I can fast without actually eating carbohydrates. Right. If you look at the physiology parameters, all fasting is trying to do is become more ketogenic, which is fat adapted. And when we look at the, the dynamics at setting up, becoming more focused on utilizing fat as fuel, I can do that through fasting by restricting food, or I can do that by eating less carbohydrates and more fat. And... What is that doing from a physiology perspective? I have less glucose, less glycogen, and my body now has to utilize other energy stores. We can only store so much fat in our actual like circulatory system. So we start going into fat into our actually stored, and that goes into our adipose tissue or our fat cells. And then we break that down through that, that what process called lipolysis, which I meant before. But the way we want to think about this just from a training session. So let's just compartmentalize that. Say I have 60 minutes and we have a pie chart that we're breaking it down. When I'm looking at anaerobic power, that pie chart should look at a very small amount of high intense work with a lot of rest. And then I just invert that with now, instead of trying to build anaerobic power or strength, now I'm gonna do bigger piece of that pie, maybe even more than 50% of that pie allocated to work and then the rest is allocated to rest so it's more dense and that could come from the form of hey i'm going to do a 
short, brief period of work with a short, brief period of rest, or I can go elongated period of work with maybe a shortened period of rest. I'm just eating into that pie with more work. And that comes at the, usually at the expense of intensity and keeping that extremely simple for everyone of, if you look at your hour, if you are expending more energy through doing more work and doing and having less rest, chances are that's going to look, feel, and smell like it's going to help lose weight. And that's the thing. It should feel intuitive, right? It should be extremely obvious, the goal, when we design a program. You should look at it and say, okay, I got, I got eights and twelves on my program. I have 30 seconds break. I have a three minute bout of bikes of bike work, or I have this where it's going to take me four or five minutes to go through the circuit. It should be obvious when you look at the program, what the goal is and and intentional with what we do. If it feels vague and nondescript and like uh, there's a, there's a periodization model of conjugate and for the folks out there that are conjugate advocates. You know, I, I, I've said bold th- statements like just, just cowards programming. Like you're not committing to anything. You're just kind of just touching on everything. Just commit and see what happens. Like what would actually, if you actually knew what you're doing and you knew what the actual physiological construct, what would that look like? You told me one goal and I actually worked with you to prioritize that goal. And you now assign me the task of helping you lose weight. And I look at it from, okay, we're going to work on the nutrition aspect and the physiology aspect and all that aspect of energy intake, but the program should be congruent with that. And we should look at if in that session, it has less work, a high intense work at any period of time with uh, optimal, optimal or maybe exaggerated rest. Am I really going to tap into gluconeogenic, gluconeogenic pathways and stimulating lipolysis or fat burning? And if not, you just have basically a program that's just doing whatever you were going to do anyway, regardless of the goal. This is what you like to do. Yeah. Yeah. So we've established, you know, the goal of phallus is breaking down. We're going to have a lot of work, a lot of density and potentially being in a caloric uh, deficit here. Are there any nutrition strategies or like supplements that might help support that training session? Yeah. So just from top of the line, magnesium is involved with pretty much every enzymatic pathway, right? Like the usually people have some sort of deficiency in magnesium from we don't have enough of it in our diet. We have high stress lifestyles. So we adrenals are just pretty much just exhaust, exhaust, exhaust system for all minerals. And if you don't have, if you have an overproduction of stress or catecholamines and cortisol, which catecholamines are going to be norepinephrine, epinephrine, and then maybe even like dopamine and other things, these dopamine, dopaminogenic pathways, you're going to have these issues with burning through magnesium. Just, it is what it is. And most people, they don't have the, the cofactors and the, the right framework or the setup to be metabolically efficient. You're going to have to fix that. So magnesium, copious amounts, make sure it's chelated where you have it attached to some sort of mineral. B vitamins, again, it has to be chelated as well. So folate over folic acid. B12 or methylcobalamate, like- Sorry, not to uh, cut you off there. A good way to know if it is chelated is that eight at the end, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if it has ATE at the end, that means it's attached to an amino acid and you can, it's more bioavailable. So yes, uh, all magnesium forms. So magnesium bisglycinate is usually the the most kind of all encompassing one. Magnesium torotate, uh, magnesium three and eight, magnesium, Mali, uh, they're going to be all pretty net beneficial. If it doesn't, it's kind of crap. Don't it? Don't take it. Same thing with B vitamins. A good B complex should have AT at the end as well. Uh, and B vitamins are the cofactors within your mitochondria that facilitate that pathway that gets once it gets past this process of glycolysis, and then it enters that mitochondria is where we actually get the production of that of that gluconeogenic pathway and lipolysis that you start to produce more energy that way, it's all going to be B vitamin contingent, right? The, 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 the NA, NADH and the FADH, niacin, folate, like that's, those are where they're coming from, right? So if we don't have that and we don't have riboflavin and all these other things, like we're not going to be able to be as efficient there. So easy enough. 
just magnesium and, and B, B complex from a chelated type of uh, form. Then looking at things like potentially carnitine, which is the shuttle system of fatty acids within the cell. Uh, carnitine specifically is a powerful uh, amino acid that's going to allow for transper- transport of these fats throughout the diet. So if I'm looking to stimulate this and if you take it in isolation, here's the problem. If you take this stuff in isolation, you're not going to burn fat, right? I think that's the problem. It's not like a take this. It's not Ozempic. It's not like you can just take this and do nothing, right? It's all predicated off you're doing something and you're becoming efficient at metabolizing energy in your body through combination of energy management of working out more and eating less it's just gas on a fire but you need to have the fire in the first place but carnitine is a good one as well um and and caffeine the most studied ergogenic aid just yeah you you're going to be able to be more efficient but if you're gonna like hey tell me the perfect like fat fat loss supplementation stack yeah it'd probably be a combination of magnesium b b complex carnitine and then just good old fashioned black coffee, which has other things like polyphenols and antioxidants and plenty of other things within reason, right? If you're a slow metabolizer of caffeine, maybe a little bit less coffee, but if you are a normal metabolizer of caffeine and what you can tell that is what's the half-life, do you feel wired and completely anxious after coffee four to six hours after you drink it? Okay, then it's going to be pretty potent for you. So just titrate down the amount of caffeine you take, right? Don't take as much, have a little bit less, but it's going to be powerful in terms of you being able to be able to burn more calories when you're working out and eating less or utilizing more fat as fuel. Then the other part is from a nutritional standpoint, right? How do we establish what is a deficit? We talked about on the weight loss, like 12 to 14 is a pretty good start point. And then until we find out that's no longer, so if I want to lose weight, maybe I start with my body weight times 12 to 14, and then I plateau. And that's where the real magic begins of, okay, now that worked until it didn't. Your body's now figured out a way to maintain and steady there. And that could come from, I'm going to lower my calories now lower based off of that 12 to 14 mark. And maybe my body mass has changed, so that 12 to 14 mark now drops. Right. Right. So now I'm, hey, I started off at 300 pounds. I got down to 275. So now that 12 to 14 changes. The other part is, okay, well, maybe it's not a calorie thing anymore. Maybe it's the arrangement of calories and talked about that from the carbs, fats, and proteins perspective. And we have two levers that we can pull. Protein will always stay the same, one gram per pound of body weight, regardless of your weight gain, weight loss, because we always want to have enough amino acids to maintain one energy. And then two, hopefully whatever muscle mass we have, if not building it, if we're trying to maybe steady, steady out our calories and then start to build muscle tissue again. But the other note is we start to look at it from, okay, now I lowered my calories. You hit me, hit this wall of, okay, I don't really have much wiggle room to lower calories anymore without me going borderline insane. I'm going to play around with your your macros and I'm going to lower your carbs and I'm going to find ways to restrict carbs from your diet that you don't even notice. And with that, and here's a pro tip, when you lower someone's carbs, you have to increase their electrolytes, specifically sodium, because a lot of our electrolytes actually come from carbohydrate sources. If you're eating breads and pastas, there's a ton of sodium in that. And people's sodium starts to drop down considerably when they lower carbs. And again, it goes down to that B vitamin, that magnesium, even zinc. All these things are just valuable cofactors. Sodium, potassium are the two fundamental things for all action potentials, as well as pretty much, and you throw in calcium in there, all all muscle contractions. So if we don't have these electrolytes in there based off of restricting carbohydrates, and we start to feel lethargic and, and energy deprived, which is natural. And the one message I would tell people, it's, you're not getting training stress like someone who's really pushing anaerobically and having this violent CNS fatigue and having restless night's sleep and feeling stressed and anxious. You're going to have hunger anxiety. Like being hungry when you're trying to lose weight is your stress. And I'm not saying starve. There's a difference between being hungry and starving. Yep. And one message I want people to know when you're trying to lose weight, you just have to look at it from the stress of feeling hunger which your default is fixing that by eating usually energy rich foods is pushing through that 
And thinking about that, that's your stressor, right? And I like to look at it, and I, I know I probably made the whole exercise thing like pretty simple like that, and that's intentional because that's not the primary stressor that I'm, I'm probably putting you through. It's going to get into the, you're going to go to bed hungry, by the way. And you're going to work out with not a energy bar and a whole bunch of Gatorade before you work out and feeling super ready from a glycogen standpoint. You're going to go into a workout tired. You're going to go into a workout maybe not feeling your best. And that, that's the point of that, right? I'm trying to drive down your energy to lose weight. And you're going to have to be more comfortable with that. And then your whole satiety, leptin and ghrelin, all these other hormones associated with that become a lot more impacted there. But the thought of, okay, well, I'm going to hit your wall calorie wise, and then I'm going to start to toggle around your, your macronutrients. And then from there, I may toggle around your macronutrient timing, right? Like, okay, we can have carbs. We're just going to time it up to your workout or your carbs. Or, hey, we're going to restrict carbs, but we're going to increase fat in the morning and at night. You might just focus on that. And whatever I'm like, I'm, I, I read your body language. I read your, your, your initial reaction to, hey, I'm going to ask you to lower your calories. And you give me this, you know, the, all right, we can go macros. Or, hey, I'm going to adjust your carbohydrate intake. Like, th I'm reacting to you based off of what I think you could be successful with. And we have an agreement at the end on a scale of one to 10, 10 being you can execute this every single day without wavering. One being I'm not going to be able to do any of this. Where are we going to fall? And if you give me a plus five, then I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to lean in that direction. I'm going to push you. I'm going to hold you accountable. I'm going to get some calls. I'm going to get some texts. I'm going to get some emails. I'm going to get whatever I need to making sure that you are going to follow through on this plan. But if it's below five, I'm just going to reduce the level of intensity. Right. If I'm getting you down to maybe 60 to 50 percent of your caloric intake before you started to lose like diet, then I'm getting to this like really big stressful danger zone of, hey, that's that's a big drop in calories from what they're normally eating. OK, I got to start to get their body language and get them agreeing with this is OK and tolerable. And that will be where I would say this is going to get from a practitioner standpoint is you have to be very receptive to them when you're giving them these recommendations and they're going to be willing to do a lot of things, but there's a tolerable upper limit that they can do over a sustainable period of time. And it's all going to come down to their compliance or lack thereof. And if they can't be compliant with it and they know that before, when you give them the recommendation, you have to interpret that quick and you have to make a decision in that moment of, do I lean harder in this and put my coaching hat on and say, it's time to go like time to rise to the occasion. Or do you go, okay, like what would be a, a step in the right direction to get you closer to that. And as I start to break down the success you have a client, I've had with clients that good ones have a clients that the situation that presents itself is going to be really in that moment different. It could be all sorts of psychological stuff associated with it. Like how many coaches work with people trying to lose weight the first of November, knowing that there's going to be two major windows that are going to probably poor compliance. So you can just throw two weeks out there and then you might have an eight week window, right? And then it's like, okay, so 75% or 75% of this, we might be able to get good compliance. All right, well, that, that sucks. And how bad are those two weeks or that 25% going to set us back? So there's a lot goes into this. We can keep going on and on. But the top of the line, okay, make your programs more dense. So more work, less rest. Start to lower your calories and then adjust your carbohydrates based off of you want to utilize more fat as fuel. That's pretty simple. Magnesium, B-complex, carnitine, a little bit of caffeine. There's, I can get super weird with it, but I don't want to because this is a public forum. But that, those are the pro tips. No, that's perfect. That's a good mic drop moment right there. <laughs> so, Don't let me get weird with it, man. I yeah, can. He, so. he likes to get weird with it. He can definitely yeah. get weird. Yeah. If you guys want to get weird with it, just put on, when we post this on social media, put on the notes, hey, what were you talking about at the end of that podcast? And yeah, uh, then, we'll then go we'll there. <laughs> All right, Corey. All right, sweet. Thanks, Tim.